Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back. I have to say that after three months uh, since my the last time I was here preaching, three months ago, and it's been uh, so much. Uh, I mean, sorry, it means uh, it, 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 it has been so long that I even forgot to get my microphone. I, f I forgot about it, so I have to use this one here now. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm happy to be back. Uh, it's good. I missed the church. I missed you. I missed to be here with you every morning, every Sunday morning, and, and somehow working, partnering with partnering with you in the in the in the gospel in this ministry. And I missed that. I never done this before in my life. I've been a pastor for almost 26 years, and this was the first time I ever was like three months without going to, a, to the church. So, yeah. Also, I want to say thank you to the board uh, of our church, our, our leaders. Uh, when they first approached me and said, uh, Jaime, you, you have to, to take some time off and, and rest, I struggled. I said, I don't know if I want that. I, I don't know even what I'm going to do out of it. And, but they insisted with me that I should, and it was very good. I had some great time with my family and with myself and with, with the Lord. So it was, it was beautiful. So thank you so much. Um, I was able to, this was not planned, but I was able to go to Mexico with Samaritan's Purse and serve in the border in the crisis they have with the migration problems. And that also was a uh, great impact in my life to, to see the struggle and to see what has been done and what can uh, be done. Um, that was very nice. And then I went to Africa, to Guinea-Bissau. I think was my, I've been to Africa many times since 2011, but this was my best time by far. Uh, everything that I was able to see and, and talk and visit and, and fellowship and to plan and dream, it was a great time for me to be there in Africa. And here I am back um, with you today. So praise the Lord for everything. Someone asked me if I, sti uh, if I even uh, know how to preach after <laughs> three months. I said, well, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. And uh, another person asked me if I still could speak English. Because I'd been speaking Portuguese and Spanish and... I don't know what else but Portuguese. Oh, but English, see. But here I am, so I, I guess today this is what it is. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> so if you have our Bibles, can you open it? And uh, the first book of uh, Kings, First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. Next Sunday will be our kickoff Sunday. We're going to have a Barbecue on Saturday, right? And Earls and Lil, thank you so much for, again, opening your space for us. So Saturday, uh, we're going to have barbecue at uh, Earls and, and Lil's. And great time for us. Every year we do that to be together and to have this time of fellowship. I think it's, it's great. You have to be there Saturday. I, I think there's some information in the bulletin for you. Uh, also, another thing is that from today on, we're no longer having evening services. So we, we've been having uh, services in Portuguese every evening, especially for the Brazilian community here in our church. But from, from now on, no, we're just having one service in the morning here in English, but we will be offering a simultaneous translation for everyone who, who need it. So in case you know someone who needs a translation, we have earphones, and let me say this very clear in Portuguese right now, okay? Um, so, de hoje em diante, não temos mais o culto à noite, mas vamos oferecer sempre a interpretação simultânea para você 
Se você precisa, logo na entrada, pegue o fone de ouvido. Hoje o Gabriel está lá fazendo a interpretação, nós temos voluntários que sempre faz, e assim esperamos que você se sinta bem em casa e à vontade aqui também. Ah, Next Sunday, we're going to begin a new series on community, being a community. What does it take for us to be a community, a true Christian community? And this is actually a, a dream of all of us, I guess, who love the Lord so much, and we love one another, and we really consider one another not disposable. We love one another so much that we go to the very end of it, if necessary. Just as John chapter 13, when Jesus says that uh, he loved those who were with him to the very end, to the very last day, he loved them. We keep on loving them, loving them nonstop, because we're, none of us are disposable. And it hurts when, for some reason, someone leaves us. So the idea of being a community, a loving community, a Christian community that we care so much for one another, that we give one another the best that we have, beginning with the word of the Lord and Jesus himself. So Paul, when he writes to the Galatians, he says, you know, I love you so much that I only speak the truth to you. And, and those kind of things are so important and necessary for us. Many years ago, when I was just beginning my ministry uh, as a pastor, someone came to me and said, Jaime, if you could uh, have a, 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 be a pastor of a church yourself, what would be the name of the main characteristic of this church? And back then, I was just a young man. I was, I don't know, 25-ish, 26, I don't remember. Um, I said, you know what, I, if I could, my, the church that I'm pastoring would be called the hugging community. The hugging, like a hug community. And someone said, why? Because you, you, you like hugging? Well, I myself, I do. And I understand some people don't, and I, I don't understand you, but I respect you. <laughs> okay? That's fine, that's okay. Okay. But when I say hugging communities, that in Portuguese, the same word for hugging is the same word for embracing. We embrace one another. And the idea is that we get attached so much to one another that we're going to love one another. And as we love one another, hugging one another, embracing one another, life is exchanged. See, if you ever, I don't know if you ever hugged someone, maybe some of you never did. But let's say if, if you hug someone, it's, unless you, unless you hug a light pole. But if you light another, if you hug another human being, as you hug, you will get a hug. It, it's, it's something both ways. And life is given as we embrace one another. More and more, we have to understand our limitations. We have to understand that we, as human beings, fallen human beings because of the sin that isn't still running in our veins, we fail. We're not perfect. We're, gonna, we're never going to be right all the, the time. And many, you know, I tell people around me, I say, you, we have to learn the word, I forgive you. People, we are going to hurt one another, constantly. And unless we make usage of this medicine that God gave us, forgiveness, we're going to break. And we're going to give up in one another. But we shouldn't. This is not what we're supposed to do, to giving up in one another. We're supposed to give, actually, life to one another and be gracious to one another. We are so good, some of us, in receiving grace from Jesus, from above. 
but not really good in spreading it around us uh, in the hor horizontal way. But we have to do so. We, all of us, we have our flaws. I, I think I told you this, that when I first began to be a pastor 26 years ago, I, I was sort of surprised when people would come to me and, and confess their sins or, or talk about their struggles and say, Pastor, I've done this. And I would, what? I even blushed. So naive, so gullible. But not anymore. There's no more surprises. And first of all, because I know myself. I know all the, the, the limitations that I have. And then because I receive God's grace to myself, I ought to share it with everybody else. And I dream of a community that is so graceful that we embrace one another and we carry one another in our arms if necessary. But we, all of us, we're going to get to the very end of the line when the day comes for us to go. I love the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. This is Elijah. Elijah probably is the superman in, in, in the Bible. He's the superhero. He is the most powerful prophet ever. So much so that when Jesus is uh, on the, the mountain of uh, transfiguration, he calls Moses and Elijah. And this was a powerful man. And he is the, the first of many prophets uh, that uh, carry on God's power and, and message to Israel. But uh, interesting that James, the apostle, the brother of Jesus, he comes and says that Elijah was just like us, with the same feelings, same limitations as all of us, although he is, was quite powerful. And I have to say, he himself was not very friendly and, and good in relationship. Probably Elijah would be very different of uh, uh, someone kind and nice and l lovable. It was not Elijah. He was sort of in his corner. And it's just me by myself. And his mood was never good, actually. We don't know much about him. Only that he was sojourning in that region in Israel. By this time, we roughly are 150 years after David. 850 years before Jesus. The, the, the kingdom of Israel has been split into two. Ten tribes, they, they formed a new kingdom called Israel. You, you remember this, Saul, the first king, and then David, the second king, and then uh, Solomon, the third king. And after Solomon, uh, the, the king is split into two. And the northern kingdom was called Israel. Ten tribes, more tribes, they got the name. Uh, we are we voting, we, we have ten of us against two of you, so we get to be Israel. And the southern uh, kingdom was called Judah. And was the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And this is what Paul, the apostle, says, I, I'm proud uh, son of Benjamin. I'm the tribe of Benjamin because the only two more sort of faithful tribes were the southern ones. The northern tribe, no, not good. Actually, they were destroyed. But Elijah is a prophet to the northern kingdom. And he is prophesying, saying that the kingdom was in sin against the Lord. And talking about sin is not something uh, enjoyable. That I have to come to you and say, this is wrong, and you're sinning against the Lord. And then as you confess, you agree in saying, Lord, I agree with you that what I'm doing, it's wrong. And then I confess it. So what happened is that the king at this time was Ahab. And quite interesting, chapter 16 said that Ahab, he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those kings before him. This was Ahab, the king of Israel, the northern tribe. Verse um, 33 of chapter 16 says, Ahab, the king, also made an Ashrad pole and did more to provoke the Lord. Look at this word. He did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger him than did all the kings of Israel before him. Th 
Judas was an evil man. And he got married to an evil woman, Jezebel. And what he did is that he actually, because of his wife, he brought idolatry to the kingdom. Baal was a king of fertility and rain. This was Baal. The new, king, the new God in Israel was not the God of Israel anymore, Jehovah. The new God in Israel, according to the king and, he, and the queen, was Baal. And he was the king, the God of fertility and God of rain. So, Elijah comes out of the blue, it seems, chapter 17, and he comes in front of the king Ahab, and this is what he says. Elijah, from Tishbet in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, as, as sure I am as my God is alive, as sure as I am that my God is real and he lives. Whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except when I say it. What? So you're worshiping a God of rain, Baal. This is your new God. But here I am on behalf of the true God, and I tell you that as long as I say it, there will be no rain for the next three years, actually, in this land. Of course, right there, he got a powerful enemy. So the king now hates him. The queen hates him, and they want to kill him. It's, and you say, Jaime... By the way, if you never met, my name is Jaime. I'm sorry about that. You may say James as well. Same spelling. Bob too. But he comes and, and says, where from? Where is this? And then you have to go, uh, for instance, for Deuteronomy chapter 11. You don't have to go now. But in Deuteronomy chapter 11, this is what God talks to Moses and to Israel. He says, if you ever worship another idol in this land that not me, the, the heavens will cease to send rain. This is God's promise. And he, he, this was his word. He says, don't you ever worship a different God than me. Because the day you do so, there will be no rain in Israel. So what Elijah does actually... He comes before the king, and it's almost, the Bible doesn't say this, but we can imagine that he comes before the king and says, My king, look at here. This is the word from the Lord when he spoke to Moses. And this is what he said in chapter 11, king. You know this, right? I'm not, I'm not saying something new. I'm not saying something out of the blue. I'm not, you know what? No, I'm quoting to you God's own word, and this is what he's saying. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain. And the ground will yield no produce. Do you understand? Elijah comes and says, I'm just quoting to you. The word that God spoke to Moses. And I'm saying to you this. This day has come. The day has come when the Lord sees you worshiping a different God. And he's no longer sending rain to this land. So as this happens. Elijah gets an enemy and he has to flee. And then he flees. And finally, he goes to a place where even the ravens uh, bring him bread and meat. And after that, he says, you know, now you go to a different place. Uh, go, uh, uh, verse 9 on chapter 17. Go at once to Zerathath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow 
in that place to supply you with food. So he went. And when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said uh, to do so. But first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the, the day the Lord gives rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was a food, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Some time later, the son of woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sins and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up this, the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son, he's alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This story is fascinating. There's a drought. There's hunger, famine. There's not much to eat. The prophet itself, the only crook that he was taking the, the water from, uh, you know, there was it, it dry out. There was no more water, in it, and he had to leave the place. The ravens uh, stopped bringing uh, food to him. So he finds this woman, and uh, the Lord said, you talk to her. And she's a poor widow. And she's uh, somehow getting some sticks on the ground that she could burn a fire and then cook the, her last meal, last meal, and then she's going to die. This is the situation. There's nothing else for her. This is it. Nothing else. And as she prepares to do so, this man, she never saw this man before, he comes to her and says, you know what? Prepare some uh, bread for me. And she said, what? Are you kidding? Look at me. I'm a poor widow. I don't have what to eat myself. I'm very poor. There's nothing left. The only thing I have is a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And you know what? I'm using this little bit of food to prepare my last portion of bread and give to my son. And this is it. We're done. We're over. The next thing we know, we're going to be dead. Hopeless. And then Elijah says, no, no, no. Go there and prepare something for me. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. You go there, you get your last flour, your last oil, and prepare bread for me. 
It is so awkward that he does this, right? Public relation, zero, n nothing for Elijah. He said, I know you're a widow, I know you're poor, I know you're dying, and you know what? Just give me your food. This is it. Why? More awkward or weird than this is the fact that she does. She does it. Not only she hears this stranger saying strange things, but she goes on to do it. She's challenged. Something tells me that she wanted to be challenged. Something that tells me that, you know what, She's, she was sort of comfort in her position, dying, but she wanted to be challenged. She wanted someone to come and shake her up and say, wake up, do something with your life. We don't know much about this woman. She only speaks three times in this whole session. And two of them, she's bitter. And then you see, of course, what else can you expect of a woman? She's widow, she lost her husband. And we have to understand the social uh, networking of, of that time. There was no retirement program. There was no Alberta health care. Uh, there was no uh, daycare for her son. No school. And you know, once she's widow, she only relies on the hopes that her son will grow to become a man one day and he will work and he will provide for her as she is older. This is, the, this is it. So this woman, she sees this man coming to her and, and, and it says, I'm so poor. And twice she speaks to him and she's very bitter. It's quite interesting that she comes to him and says, your God, she says. This is what she says in verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God. Not mine. It's yours. I, I don't know him. You keep saying that uh, your God lives. But let me say something. I don't know. We have to understand this. His name Elijah. Exactly. El Ja in Hebrew was God lives. This was his name. Ahab would hate him. The, the, the word El was short for Jehovah. So every time Ahab would hear about Elijah, he would hear not Elijah. He would hear the word, there goes Jehovah lives. I'm telling my nation that Baal is the God, but this man is telling the nation that Jehovah lives. Every time he spoke his name, every time he spoke, I am Elijah, every time he was saying, Jehovah lives, Jehovah lives, Jehovah lives. And this woman, hopeless, with her last sticks to make some fire, she comes to him and says, your God may live. But I don't know about mine. But somehow she takes the challenge and goes and prepares her last meal just to die. And then she prepares it. And then he promises her, if you do so, you're going to have oil as long as there's dry. And you're going to have flour as long as there's no rain. You're going to have it. Just do it. And she does. She does. And the Bible says, For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord. So, we don't know how many months Elijah was in this house. But we know that for an entire period, there was food in the house. Every morning, they would wake up, the three of them. You have to understand, Elijah was in the upper room. When you think about upper room, think about a square building. And she and her son would live in the main floor. And Elijah was in the roof of the house. This is it. The roof of the house those days, they were used to dry seed, uh, to store water. 
to like a pantry and maybe to host some guests. If you're visiting, you would go to the roof and you stay there. Give you mattresses and you, this is your home. This is where he was those days. But every single day, they had food. Every single day. And you know what? Sometimes we just get used to miracles. I don't know if you had opportunity to say thank you, Jesus, for breakfast this morning. I don't know if you had the opportunity to say, Jesus, thank you so much for my family today. Lord, thank you for taking care of me in my life this day. Well, we get used to things. We take for granted that every day we're going to have breakfast. I was in Guinea-Bissau now, uh, this last July in Africa, Central West Africa, by the Atlantic. And the place where I visit, it's common for them to have food every other day, once a day. So it's common for them to have food every other day, once a day. Children normally, they eat the next day only, around 5 p.m. So they have a little bowl of rice, and then they go to bed with their belly a little full. They don't cry, and they can sleep. But we... We get so used to have breakfast every morning. We go to any Tim Hortons and all the same other, other kind of uh, coffee shops. And you just reach out to the pocket and say, give me one, two, three, four coffees and, and donuts. And we have it. And maybe we're just used to it. You know, we're used to it. As much as everybody else around her... They were starving and dying. She was having breakfast every morning. And she never considered that that was a provision, was a miracle. And so do we have to consider the provision, the miracle to God. Every, I, sometimes I think we really fully don't understand the, the damage sin caused to us. Well, maybe, you know, C.S. Lewis once was asked, if God is so good, why there are people starving? And C.S. Lewis says, you know, this is the wrong question. The question is not why there's people starving. The question, when we understand the gravity of sin, the question is why there are some people still eating? Why there are some people still enjoying comfort and prosperity? Sin killed us and killed every single hope of us to really enjoy life as fully as we should. It's like a cancer that entered our, our bodies and our, our society and everything. Everything is out of order, out of, out of control. It's the world is spinning. So we have to praise the Lord every single day that we have a new miracle. And not only consider, take for granted. You know what? Oh, another breakfast. Oh, pancakes and, and bacon and coffee and milk and bread and everything else. No, Lord Almighty, I thank you. There are seven billion people in this world. And maybe only one billion people today is having breakfast. But we get so used. And then, you know what? We are not beggars anymore. We're not on the streets getting sticks to cook the last meal. And I understand Christians who really understand what sin has done to us. We all constantly are beggars, ragamuffin, in, in His presence. Constantly coming to Him and saying, Lord, thank you for your blessing to me today. Thank you for my family. Because the norm... It's hunger. It's starvation. The norm is divorce and fight and split and, and, and everything else. Anger, envy. This is the norm for sin. This world is under the control of sin. And his mastermind, devil himself. But the thing is that she just took for granted. 
I'm having every single day. Everybody around me is dying, starving, and I'm having breakfast every morning. Until her son gets uh, ill and things go worse and he dies. And then he forgets, she forgets. Because she took for granted that breakfast is just norm. And she forgot that the Lord who does every single day a new miracle, he can do big, bigger miracles as well. Maybe she thought, you know what? God is not in control anymore. The Bible says every morning God renews his mercy. Every morning. You know what? This morning when you woke up, there she was. Mercy, waiting for you at the door. Good morning. Here I am. New mercy unto you. New. It's me, as Isaiah 48 says, I have written your name on the palm of my hand. So every day I have remembered to bless you. Every single day. Those who love me, those who seek my, my, my face. Every day I will be reminded in my hands. In my hand, it's quite beautiful when, when Jesus is resurrected and he comes to that door, the door is locked, the Bible says, nobody opens the door, he goes through the door and he enters the room and the apostles are there crying. And then Thomas, he comes and says, you know what, let me see your, your hand. And he has been glorified already, Jesus. And although he's been glorified, he kept the mark in his hands. Every single day, Jaime, 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 I have to love you. Every single day, regardless of the size, if there is any, of my sin, he is reminded of blessing me because he paid the price for me. So we forget. We're not used to be grateful anymore. We're so powerful. Look at this beautiful nation where we live. Everything is under control, sort of. We have food every day on our plates. There's prosperity everywhere. Construction everywhere. The prairies are producing so much grain, the, the, uh, more than anywhere in the world. And then we forget, you know what? Just one more breakfast. Just one more hug. Just one more grandson hugging me. And because we forgot the this, this, this small little blessings, if I say, we forget that the same one who provides every day for us is the same one who can really provide big time when we need it. Our hearts, they get heavy and they don't learn to be thankful anymore. And the first opportunity we have, we turn our backs onto him. So the, the boy dies. And as soon as the boy dies, she is out of control, naturally. I would too. But one thing is to be out of control, and I don't blame her. One thing is to, is to, to cry, to scream. One thing is this, because of a son. Another thing is to go against the Lord she says, what do you have against me? You came to my house to bring a curse to me. Are you here to remind me of my sins? Interesting. First, she never saw this man before, and then she actually takes the challenge he gives her, and then she is blessed for many, many months. And then when the son dies... She comes to him and says, are you here to remind me of my sins? Elijah didn't say anything. She says it. It was there, hidden in the back of her mind, her conscience. We don't know why she was a widow. Was she, was she to bl be blamed uh, for her husband's death? We don't know. Did she did something wrong with her son and then her son died? We don't know. Why was she poor? 
Have, have she done anything bad in the past? And, and then there's something accusing her nonstop and she's heavy on this. But the fact is that that situation brought up the, everything that was inside of her heart. And she has to deal with it. She never knew that Jesus has paid it all. You know, I have something about sin. We don't have to suffer because of sin. Sin, as any other choice that you make, there are consequences. If you choose to marry, there are consequences of being married. If you choose not to marry, there are consequences of being single. There's nothing wrong with either. Both are okay. There's no sin either. If you choose to work, there are consequences of working. You have to submit yourself to your boss. You have to be there every day at 7 in the morning. And, and there, there are nice things that you have to have your salary every month. If you choose not to work, there are consequences. You can sleep over until noon and have no salary. Consequences. Sin, there will have consequences. But not suffering. Isaiah 53 says, Jesus carried in his body all the price was paid, all the suffering was paid. There is no more punishment. Nobody will ever be punished for their sin anymore. There will no longer be punishment. First Peter says that Jesus bore in his body our sins. He like sucked everything into him. E everything. Past, present, and future sins. He sucked into himself. Paul writes to the Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. And he says we were redeemed of the price of the curse of the law. There's no more. No longer. There's no more punishment. Nobody, you can never let someone come to you and say, you know why you're doing this? God is punishing you because of your sin. You stop right there. You stop right there. There's no punishment. Because if there's one single punishment, the cross was not enough. You understand this? One thing is punishment. Another thing is consequences. It may have consequences. Depending on what kind of sin you have committed. Right? You are not supposed to have sex before marriage. And let's say you have, and, and maybe someone will get pregnant. There's a consequence. Never a punishment. Punishment is done very much so on the cross. And we have to exercise grace with one another. Understanding this. She didn't know this. She says, wow. Are you here to remind me of my sins? Elijah doesn't say anything. He takes the baby, the boy. Not a baby, but a boy. And goes to upper room. And there he struggles with the Lord himself. He himself struggling with the Lord. Lord, why? Why are you doing this? This woman is taking care of me and now... The only precious thing she has is her son, and you, you take him from, from her. Why are you doing this? And you know what? Here you can see how much Elijah was so much like us. He also was struggling. You know, and we've learned this so many times over and over again that in times of crisis, you don't ask why. In times of Christ, you should affirm to yourself who or whom. Who's in control? Who is right there? Who is involved in this process? Because if you believe that God is involved in this process, you're good. You shouldn't be surprised of any bad news. You shouldn't be surprised of tragedies. But you should be surprised if for some reason God is not part of a process. Because he is. So he prays and he then lays this boy's body down. And he embraces him. And he embraces him. And he prays to the Lord. And the Bible says he does it three times. Elijah is so humble. Because as powerful as he was as a prophet, he, he should have said, you know, once is enough. 
And he prays and nothing happens. And then he prays and nothing happens. And then finally he prays and the boy is alive again. The Lord hears his cry. Second Kings chapter 4, there's another story similar to Elisha. Not, that, not Elijah, but Elisha. When another boy dies, and the Bible says he embraces him and warms his body. And I think of us as a church. How many of us are dying? We're alone. We're in our homes by ourselves. Everything we have around us are bad news. Relationship, finances, health-wise, loneliness. And then there's a community that comes and embraces us. And our body is so cold. Our faith is so cold. Not long ago, one woman came to me and said, Pastor, I don't think I have a faith anymore. I'm as cold as a cube of ice in my faith. And I asked her, where is your community to embrace you this time? Remember in Acts chapter 20, Paul is preaching. And he, Paul was not like me. I only preach, you know, 10, 15 minutes. No, no more than that. Right? I'm, I'm, I haven't begun yet. I'm just, this is just the introduction. But Paul was preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. And then this, this young man fell and, and he died. Do you remember his name? Oh, you don't, see? Eurydicus, that's right. And then Paul goes there and he kneels and embraces him, hugs him. And as he does, he shouts, life is still running within his body. Life is still running within his body. Do you know that we need this? This is what we need. We will face over and over again a society beyond this wall. And sometimes within the wall, we will face a society that's bitter. A society that says, your God, your God, your God, pointing, pointing to us. Over and over again, we'll, go, we'll, we'll see people that say, you know what, this is your God, not mine. I've done everything because of your God, not because of my God. Unbelief. Over and over again, someone being blessed every single day, every single day, it does not acknowledge, does not recognize that God is being, being faithful to them, blessing them every day, and they just don't see it. They just don't see it. Remember me in the airport, Houston airport? Here I was at the airport, and then everybody taking photos. And then my friend comes to me and says, Johnny, Johnny, this famous blonde actress, Hollywood, she was just near you. And I didn't see her. And then I said, you know what? This is why people are taking photos of me. <laughs> I thought they were taking photos of me. It was this woman, I don't, even today, I don't know her name. Maybe it's Greta Garbo. I don't know. We just don't see it. And we're going to find people that they don't see that God is being faithful to them, blessing them. And here we are with this responsibility of being a hugging community that we embrace one another. And as we do it, there's a transmission of life. As we embrace one another, we warm up each other's body. And life begins to come to us again. As he goes back down where she was crying, probably screaming because of her son just died. Elijah, who entered the, the, the scene with a, with a shout, as he enters the, chapter 17, he says, uh, as much as God of Israel lives, he ends his words to say, Here's your son. He lives. You know what? We are resurrected people. We have the resurrection of life inside of us. 
In John chapter 11, Jesus says, I am the resurre resurrection and life. And if you believe in me, you're never going to die again. Never. Just before service, I was talking to someone, and I said, you know what? The, the, the material body life, the biological life we have, it is inevitable. But the eternal life, it's not. You can do something about it. You don't have to die eternally. You can do something about it and you can live eternally actually. But you have to believe that. And I think that the woman comes and she says in the last verse, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Sometimes we're preaching, we're preaching, we're preaching, but something in our life is different from what we say. As a body that we are, as a church that we are, that belongs to a Savior, that has given us new life, eternal life, divine quality kind of life inside of us, running into our veins. From the day I gave my life to Jesus, I'm eternal. I may die biologically, but I'll live eternally. On and on and on and on. And as not only quantity of life, but it's a quality, a divine quality of life now was injected inside of me through the cross. The day the Holy Spirit began to abide and live in me, within me, a little bit of divine began to make my heart beat. And then now it's different. Now it's just not the carnal Jaime. But there's a little bit of divine within me. And as a resurrected church, as a re re resurrected man, people should see this power of the resurrection in my life. To the point that they will say, wow, what you said is true and comes from the Lord. We have to live where our mouth goes. We have to do it. We believe. And as we face droughts everywhere, there's a huge drought in Calgary, although it's been raining a lot these days. There's a drought. Loneliness. I just read recently the police is quite concerned about the number of suicide in the city. Depression. Did you know, I don't know if you knew that, but Canada is leading country in the world in depression, mainly because of winter. Statistics. Where are we as church, as a, com a hugging community, that we are going there and keep on loving them, until their body warm up. And to the very end, they will say, wow. It's not your God anymore. It's my God now. Change. It's not your God, Jaime. Now he is mine. Understand this. Remember David, Psalm 23rd? The Lord is my shepherd. Elijah was saying, the Lord is good. The Lord is great. But you don't see it. You'd rather be bitter. Every single day he blesses you, but you'd rather not to understand that. But here I am to tell you with my words and with my life that he is good and he is great. And he loves you and he wants to bring life to you. Brothers and sisters, I think so many of us here in this church, we need to be embraced. There are some invisible people amongst us. They cannot. They cannot be invisible. There's no way I could accept whether cultural, barrier. Some people told me, I don't say hi to people because I don't speak the language. I have this horrible accent. There's no excuse. We are all human beings in need of being embraced by one another. And I hope you understand I'm not being literal here as hugging, but embracing and noticing that people exist. 
There's no way that someone can enter this, the gate of this temple and leaves here without someone asking them, hey, how are you? If they want, if they can't say hi, if they can't stay one minute and chat with you, that's fine. But we should. The same way that Jesus, as this came so much after me, after me, persecuting me until he found me and I gave in to him. We should do with people. Be gracious and over and over gracious again until people give in and say, you know what? This God of yours, I want it to be my God as well. So there is it. There's drought everywhere. We should get to know who is here and then love. And then we should get to know who is right there and right there and right there and there and actually introduce ourselves to them. We may find some bitterness. We may find some people who will never notice that the Lord being, is being good and blessing them every day. Every day, every day. We may. And then it might be a tragedy necessary for you and I to come and hug and say, let me give you life in the family. I think we can do it. I believe that. It's not necessarily from here, from one Sunday after another Sunday after another Sunday. It's, it's very important, this, the teaching. But it's every day being thankful. Every day breaking corruption everywhere there. Bitterness and bringing life every day to people. I wish we could understand this. And we could pray, Lord, would you give me the ability, the power, not only to say it, not only to say it. Maybe you've been in church for so many years, you, you know from Genesis to Revelation, everything. We're not to recite. We're not just to read and say things. We are to give life to this world. Life has been given to me, to you, and we have to share it. Jesus says, I will become, I will become a fountain of water inside of you, he says in John chapter 4. A fountain of water that will run from within to everywhere there. And they will drink and they 